and welcome back to Giovanna Designs. If this is your first time here, welcome to my channel. If you've been here before, welcome back. Thank you for being here again. And thank you everyone for your patience. Um, I haven't been on camera in, gosh, almost six weeks. Thank you so much, COVID, for that. I really appreciate it. And um, I missed you guys. So I'm really excited to get back to normal. <laughs> you know, um, thank God we all had very light cases, but the whole family had it. So it's been a trip. Um, and of course I took longer to recover from anybody else because of my issues. So, uh, but I'm done, it's all dead, I'm all good. So I'm excited to get back to painting and get back to being on camera and talking to you guys. So uh, what are we doing today? All right, so today is Q and A day. I'm finally gotten around to doing the question and answer video. I promised you guys, gosh, almost eight year, weeks ago. Eight years, really? <laughs> it feels like it's been eight years, eight weeks ago. Um, and so we're doing all kinds of question and answers today. What I did was I went over all of the email questions and the comment questions and the more recent comment questions um, since I even started this uh, channel back in June-ish. Um, and so I kind of tallied everything and said, okay, what are you guys really the most interested in? There's quite a lot of information here, so get comfortable. Get your coffee, tea, wine, whatever you like, and just get a real comfy seat because there's a lot to go over. And I talk pretty fast, so hopefully this won't be four hours long, but you know, there's a lot to go over and I think it's really valuable information. So, um, all right, so what are we gonna actually talk about? Well, I'm gonna talk about the brands that I use and why I like them, um, the tools, uh, what I, find valuable and what I think you don't maybe you don't need so much uh, resin and varnish that's always been huge questions about that technique there's lots of questions about technique how I do what I do and why you would do one versus the other and that kind of stuff personal questions yeah I'm gonna answer them um, I usually don't really talk about my personal life my family my stuff like that occasionally I'll talk about EDS but um, yeah but I'm gonna answer all of your questions there uh, opinions and advice, I've got a lot about that. Uh, paint mixes, the biggest question ever are two big things. What hair dryer do you use and what is your recipe? So we're gonna go over the recipes, plural, that I use and why I use them and what I use in, in each thing. And I'm gonna give you very detailed. I'm not trying to be secretive at all, but they change. So I'll go over all that. And then YouTube, a lot of you had questions about YouTube. Um, I guess you're all interested in starting a channel. So I mean, I'm gonna answer your questions about YouTube. So, all right, let's jump right into it. Okay, so all of the brands I like and why I like them. I'm going to start this with a disclaimer. I'm gonna tell you this right up front so that you hear it from my mouth. Yes, I am an affiliate of some of the brands that I love. Why am I an affiliate of some of the brands I love? Because I love them. I truly, truly love them. I believe in them. I will never, ever recommend something to you guys that I don't wholeheartedly a thousand percent believe in or love. I won't tell you, hey, this is a great product, go buy it, and by the way, I get a commission for it, and you get it, and you're like, what? What was she talking about? This is terrible. I don't ever wanna do that. I feel like it's my integrity online there. Um, it's not my character to do that. This, to me, this this channel is a two-way street, and I feel like it's it's gotta benefit us both, or you know, it's not worth doing. So if I believe in a product a lot, um, what I will do sometimes is contact them and ask them for an affiliation. And if they say yes, well then fantastic. Um, and if not, I still love them and I'll still talk about them. <laughs> but um, I won't ever talk about a company or a product that I don't truly love. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to get that out of the way and let you know up front what that's all about. Okay, so speaking of which, resin, stone coat resin, a thousand percent totally love them. And yes, I am an affiliate of them, but this is one of those companies where I fell in love with them first and then called them and said, hey, do you guys do affiliations with smaller channels? Because I really love you and I'd love to talk about you on camera if you're comfortable with that, but I don't want to do that if you're not comfortable with that. So, you know, you don't know me and all that stuff. So they checked out my channel and they said, yes, we'd like to do that with you guys. So I am going to actually be doing a resin video at some point um, going over the way that I resin my paintings. Now, that being said, I am not a resin expert by any means. I'm not a person who does like crafting and you know the coasters and the trays and stuff like that with resin, although I'm gonna get into that. I'm really, really curious to start doing that. I just haven't had the time. But um, I find that I've had just a very different experience with Stone Coat than with other resins. And when I first started using resin, I was using um, art resin and chaos resin and I know a lot of other people swear by them. Um, I find them to be more cost effective. Yes, that's true. 
but to me, they were not worth the inconvenience. Um, stone coat, I'll talk about the positives of stone coat, not the other way around. Stone coat is less sticky than other resins. Um, it's easier, it's a little thinner, so it's easier to mix. And for me, with my shoulder and my wrists, that's very important with my joints. Um, it has a longer working time and it's super easy to clean up. Baby wipes, your best friend, they're fantastic. Um, and so that's really the main reasons why I love them and I think they're great. Okay, but, and, and customer service. Customer service is fantastic. Uh, okay, varnish. I've only ever used Liquitex high gloss varnish. I like it, I used it, I, but why bother trying anything else, right? So that's the one I use there. Tape, I got a lot of questions about tape. I never thought tape was such an important thing, <laughs> but apparently people are really interested in what tape you use. Um, Again, it was in my house, and so I started using the 3M, doo -doo -doo -doo. I'm gonna be reaching under to grab some little things as it goes. The 3M tape, um, the blue one, I have an orange one too. I got it at Home Depot. I'm sure there are less expensive ones out there. It just happened to have a couple of rolls in the house because we were doing a painting project before I started the channel, and so I started using that. Uh, and so I keep using it because it works for me. I find it has a real clean, when you pull it off, it's really clean edged, and I like that. Uh, do, do, do paints. Okay, so got a lot of paints I really like. Um, they're all artist qualities, and I just find that that makes a huge difference, and I'll get into that when it comes to the advice section. Pabeo Iridescent Studios, one of my favorites. I think it has a beautiful, beautiful finish uh, when it's dry. Arteza and Arteza Pearls. I love their pearl collection. I think that they have a lot of variety in their colors um, and subtle differences in their colors and it's just again a really really pretty finish it's not a full metallic but it's a really pretty pearl and I like that a lot um, deco art extreme sheen by far love them they make some really cool effects when it comes to um, cells and chemical reactions with other paints and so I like the deco art extreme sheen line that's my favorite from them um, although they are going to send me some other you know new stuff that they have I can't remember the name of it but there was one like a dragon egg kind of a, it was really, really cool looking. So they're gonna send me that. I called them and I asked them if they wanted to do that. Um, Amsterdam, definitely. That's a classic for sure. Just a super, super highly pigmented paint that's really creamy and really good. Liquitex is a classic. Again, that one, no problems with that. Um, I don't find that there's anything special about it, but it works beautifully. So Golden, I don't know if Golden is worth the money, to be honest with you. You know, <sighs> I don't find that it's that much different than other paints necessarily. So unless there's like, you know, um, you like a certain color that you just have to have, it's super expensive. So I'm not sure if you really wanna go down that road, but I like them. I mean, it's nothing wrong with them. They're great. It's just a matter of they're so much more expensive than everything else that you don't need to go the golden route. Uh, and Modern Masters. That's been a recent um, find of mine that I know a lot of other you, you guys are using it, but I just found them recently and I love them. I think they bought a whole line of them. I think I told you that. Um, I probably have eight or 10 of them. They're great. They're beautiful colors. They're really opaque. Um, and it says it on the bottle, whether it's opaque or semi-transparent. Um, and they're really, really good. Okay. Uh, pigments. Come on now. You guys know I love color art. <laughs> Primary elements is like my favorite thing in the whole world. They're super sparkly. They're super pretty. The colors are really vibrant. They're just Gorgeous, and I love them to death. Um, and Leslie is amazing as far as customer service is concerned. And yes, I'm an affiliate of Color Art. You all know that. I put that on the bottom of every every you know video. I'll probably have it on the bottom right now underneath when I'm talking. But um, again, that's another one that I started using them first, and I contacted them. So you know, I truly believe that they are gorgeous, gorgeous pigments. Uh, okay, canvases. Michael's level three. If you want to get a, a splined canvas, that is the way to go for me. And now what does that mean? Okay, so I guess I'm pulling out my little trickster bags here. So splined means that your canvas around the back is not stapled here. You see where the staples go across a canvas? That's called a staple back. Splined means that there's a little piece of rubber, like a little rubber gasket, that is how the canvas is held to the wood is that there's a slit in the wood, the, um, the canvas goes in there, and then they put that rubber strip here, and that's what holds the canvas in place. So I really like those for pieces that I'm going to sell, unless somebody wants a museum, museum quality, sorry, I'm flubbing my words, museum quality piece. And in that regard, then I go to Blick, because Blick has the two and three eighths sides 
that are stapled back, but they're really high quality canvases and I like them a lot. So, um, so that's my canvases. And I think, oh, that's the other thing I wanted to say. If you're gonna buy canvases in bulk, I like Artist Loft. Um, they do have the seven or 10 packs and they're really, really cost effective. Uh, so that's what I do there. Okay, on to tools. So my hair dryer, what hair dryer do I use? I have the cheapest hair dryer on the planet probably. <laughs> um, it's a no name, nothing brand, just cause it's red people think it's fancy. I don't know. It's called X Polymen is the brand name. Never heard of it. Uh, I bought it off Amazon. Amazon's my best friend when it comes to shopping. I bought it off Amazon and I just wanted the shape of it more than anything else. It has a cool setting on it. Um, it has a low and high, which is important to me versus the cool shot there's a cool setting so I don't have to hold it down with my finger, which is a problem for me. It's not a problem for 90% probably of, of anybody out there, but for me, it's an issue um, with my fingers. So what I find though, it makes the difference with whatever hair dryer you're going to buy is not the hair dryer itself, as long as you get the right strengths. This one's 1800, 1875 is more common. Um, and again, that's something you just get used to one versus the other, how fast you know the, the airflow is. But what makes the biggest difference is the concentrator, the nozzle here, and the shape of the nozzle. So now, for me, this one is completely parallel across the middle here, okay? And it's got a decent width to it. So what you wanna do is to notice which one you're using, whether it's gonna be parallel like this, or sometimes they balloon out in the middle, sometimes it's a complete circle in the middle, and then it'll go to like an ellipse on the edges. That makes a difference when it comes to the airflow because that's now your air is going to be going in a thin stream across, which is what mine does, or it's going to be ballooning out in the middle will make your paint move differently. No right or wrong to that. It's just personal preference, but that's the difference between hair dryers that makes such a difference in the way that people blow out their paints. Okay. Um, the torch again, it doesn't even have a name on it. It's just red. It's no fancy, super fancy thing. It's a culinary torch. You want to get a culinary torch. Um, and what made me choose this one is again, it's got a, a button on it that holds the torch down. So now once I light it, I hold that button down and now I don't have to hold it down with my finger constantly. The torch stays lit. So that's why I liked that one. Uh, my heat gun. Where is it? Okay, here it is. Uh, I have it over here because I haven't done resin. Chandler brand. Again, I don't know that it makes a difference. Why I like this one specifically is because it doesn't have a handle like a hair dryer does. It's like, it's got no handle at all. And so for me, that's really comfortable when I'm working, you know, with it. Mm, cups, okay. So <laughs> here's a biggie for me. Um, I first started using Dixie cups because I thought, okay, well, they're the perfect size and I'm gonna use a thousand of them. So I bought, I'm not kidding, a thousand of them, <laughs> okay, in bulk pack. Well, uh, here's the problem. I bought the ones that were just paper and I thought I was being very environmentally conscious and thinking, okay, well, these are gonna recycle better than the ones that are like lined with some sort of plastic lining on them. And the problem there is that they disintegrate <laughs> when you stay wet too long. And so I go and I pour my paints in and I'm mixing and I'm stirring and I'm stirring and all of a sudden I'm stirring and my, you know, my stick is now going through the cup <laughs> because it's now disintegrated as I'm working with it. So just be aware if you're going, now I have a thousand baby cups. If you're going to be using any kind of, you know, paper cup at all, make sure you're getting the ones that are aligned <laughs> with some sort of, you know, plastic lining to them so that that doesn't happen to you. What I do recommend that you buy is the little plastic cups. They come in a variety of sizes. They have one ounce, they have two and a half ounce, they have two ounce, I think. They have five and a half ounce. They're great. Sometimes from the four ounce even. Um, and those are called either shot glasses, sample cups, condiment cups, um, yeah, I think that's about it. Takeout cups even. And uh, you can get them with the lids or you can get the lids separately. So if you are a person who notices that you go through a ton of them without ever saving paint, don't bother buying the ones with the lids. You can buy the lids separately and that way then you just have, you know, 100 lids and 400 cups and then that works out better for you financially. So just keep an eye on that one. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so where to get or the best place to get Stir sticks, canvas panels, measuring cups, silicone spatulas, the dollar store. I don't personally, well, listen, every dollar store is different, right? The ones by me, I don't get my little cups there because they're like 
five for a dollar or 10 for a dollar. And it's not financially, you know, that doesn't make sense because I can go and get them on Amazon and get hundreds of them for a couple of bucks. So for me, that doesn't make sense. But I know a lot of people do get their little cups at the dollar store, so see if they have them by you. Um, the canvas panels are like four for a dollar. They are, which I think are great. And they're pretty big. Um, stir sticks, for sure. I get one or 200 stir sticks, depending on the size of the stir stick, for a buck. They're great. Uh, and then measuring cups. Yeah, I mean, I got <laughs> stuck to the table. I, I resined last night and it's not completely, you know, dry yet. So, I mean, this guy was a buck and this is gonna peel right off of here. The resin's gonna come right out of it. And then I'm gonna use that a thousand times over. So that's great. And then where's the silicone spatula? Did I wanna, no. Do I have it? No, I don't. Yes, I do. <clears throat> this guy, this is what I'm talking about. This is great for a bunch of different things. This is great for, because everything just peels right off of it or wash, washes off of it. So you can use this for mixing resin. I love to use this as a catalyst wedge. I think this is great, you know, to actually paint with this. Um, and I have, so I have a bunch of those. Screws. Hmm. Okay, so I get the two inch eye screws. They're called eye screws or eye hooks and the threaded ones. Okay, so they look like that. And these, what I do with these is they go straight into the back of the canvas right in the corner. So right where this wood meets the, um, the canvas and there's the spline is right there. They go right in there and I just screw them in. That way I don't have to, um, to hammer them in. So that's why I use the screws and not the pins. For me, again, because of my hands, um, they get locked up really easily. So pushing a push pin in, you know, my fingers do that, it's not good. So, you know, I jam my fingers and that's no good. So what I was starting to do was like hammering them in, but then if I needed to pull them out to adjust them a little bit, they wouldn't stay out, they would slip right back in again. So with the screws, once they're in place, I can unscrew one a little bit, screw another one in tighter until my piece is perfectly level. So that's why I do that. On to the next subject. Can you tell that I'm trying to be really quick about this? <laughs> the last, okay, so backstory. I recorded this video twice now <laughs> with problems with my camera. The first time, I didn't know what was going on. I thought it was a glitch in my editing system. And so I canceled that entire video out and redid it. And it, it ends up that something happened. My phone had an update, which made the camera record in 8K. And if any of you know anything about video recording, I didn't even notice it was happening. But um, yeah, so the editing software doesn't support that. And so I couldn't use those videos. They were scrapped. So this is the third time I'm doing this. So I kind of know what I want to say. And I'm trying to get it out real quick because the other shoes are super long. Okay. So can you resin over varnish? Yes, you can. And you don't have to do anything to resin over varnish. You just go for it. Now, why would you want to resin over varnish? Well, you have a piece that's varnished already and your client calls and says, I love it, but I want it resined. Okay. No problem. Resin right over it. Uh, do you sand between coats of resin? Yes and no, depending on time frame. If I have a piece that I have resined and it's been sitting around for three weeks and I wanna do the second coat, yes, definitely. What you wanna do is a very light sanding of the whole top just so that the two pieces will adhere together. Very similarly to when you get acrylic nails and you have to sand down your nail beds because they're too smooth and then the glue will actually adhere to it, it's the same thing. So you want the two layers of resin to adhere to each other really well. If it's been 48 hours, you don't need to do that. There's no reason to do it at all. But if it's been a couple of weeks, then yes, you definitely want to do it. Okay, can you use primary elements in resin? Uh, yes and no. So traditionally, no, you can't. Um, but you can buy something called art fluid and that will make the pigments acceptable into resin. So why is that? Well, primary elements are not just mica powders other than the Blingit line um, or any of their micas or their resin art line. Their resin art line is specifically made for resin, okay? But the primary elements is traditionally made for acrylic painting. And what it is, is that it's mica powder plus pigments. And so you need the art fluid to dissolve the pigments, at, which then blends into the resin without a problem. So just grab some of that. If you have like a whole, you know, load of, of primary elements and you want to be able to use them in both, the art fluid's the way to go there. Sealing in primary elements before varnishing to avoid smearing. Okay, yes. So again, because primary elements are a water-based um, product, 
what will happen then is after your painting is completely dry, let's say you took a water spray gun, I don't know why you'd ever do this, before it's sealed, and you sprayed it all over your piece, well, they're just gonna go everywhere. They're gonna smear, they reactivate, not like a traditional paint would, okay? So then if you're gonna take a varnish, which is a water-based product, and wet the top of your canvas, same thing. They're gonna smear all over your canvas. So what you wanna do is take a um, spray varnish and lightly just do one quick coat over the whole piece and then you can use your um, your liquid varnish like you normally would. The other way to do that is just to be super, super, super careful and use very little varnish on your brush and go over once quickly and then stop. And that will then you know not make it move around um before it's dried once the first coat is on you can go ahead and put on four more coats it won't even matter because that's then sealed the pigments onto the canvas uh how long do you wait before varnishing and resining i don't wait a specific amount of time that i know a lot of people say three weeks and six weeks and i mean to me once a piece is bone dry and i mean bone dry you're good to go i've never had an issue with anything happening but i also do dutch pours right so my paint is very thin on the canvas. I have a very thin coat of paint on the canvas before it's drying. Now, if you're gonna do something like, um, you know, ring pour or a flip cup and you're gonna have a lot more paint on the canvas, you're gonna wanna wait a while before you actually top coat it because you're gonna want all of that paint and the thickness of that paint to completely dry. So just, I would say a week, maybe, maybe even two, depending on, again, if, that, if you're doing a thick piece. Uh, how long do you wait to ship a piece after resining and varnishing? So, a week. <laughs> yeah, um, and resin sometimes a little longer depending on the humidity and all that good stuff. Um, but I feel safe after a week. I feel like I feel safe. I've never had any kind of like scratching or anything like that happen after a week. That resin is solid. So, you know, yeah, you're fine with that one. Uh, how do you clean off the resin drips? So... Okay, perfect example, if you're gonna take this piece, right? Generally speaking, what I do is because I like the color on the edges of my paintings and I like it to kind of follow over. I just feel like that looks really cool. When I've done it and I've taped right up against the edge, sometimes you see a little white trim here if you don't go far enough down. So yeah, I leave it like this at first. Once the painting is dry, and that's all on here already, then I will put another piece of tape right upon the edge. Now I'm gonna resin it, right? Well, once my resin is dry, then what I do is I take my heat gun, heat that up very carefully, quickly moving, don't stay in one spot for too long, and then I peel that off. Now, when I peel that off, all those drips that are sitting on top of the blue tape are gonna come off with the tape. So it's really not an issue. Now. <laughs> On the off chance, and I say off chance, it's a joke, it happens all the time, that I forget to then do my second piece of tape up against the edge. Now I've got resin on my canvas. Well then what you do is you take your heat gun, go over them really fast, just for a while, make sure they're really nice and warm, and then take a razor, like an X-Acto knife, something like that, and just shave them right off. Just be really careful you're not digging in, because then you'll hit your canvas and you don't wanna do that. Okay, let's see, what's the next one? How do I get my resin to cover all the way to my edges? Okay, so if your resin is really nice and smooth and glossy on the surface of your painting, and then all along here, you actually see the texture of your canvas, the problem with that is you only have one coat of resin on it. And that's it. There's really, you haven't done anything wrong. You have to do a second coat. So here's where I'm gonna get on my soapbox for a little bit. <laughs> um, I personally feel that a piece that is going to be sold should not be sold with one coat of resin for that reason. I think, you know, when people decide how much they're going to charge for their work um, and it's going to be pretty pricey for a resin piece, they should be giving you um, a top quality piece that is finished to the nines. And that to me is not finished. A one coat, piece, uh, you know, resin, one coat of resin is not to me, <laughs> this is my personal opinion, um, is not what you should be paying hundreds of dollars for. So, you know, don't accept that <laughs> to me. I, it just, I keep saying to me, right? It is a personal opinion. I don't wanna offend anybody, but I feel like, you know, if I'm gonna charge a good amount of money for something, I'm gonna give somebody my best work that is finished, you know, completely and totally. And that seems sort of like it's not 
done. It just seems sort of like it, it's, it's halfway done. <laughs> so two coats of resin at least. Um, and the first coat, what's going to happen is then that's going to level out and just barely cover the edges like you're seeing. Second coat's going to give you that nice finish that's almost like rounded out over the, um, over the edges of your piece and it's going to be beautiful. Uh, do, 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 how to minimize dust and hair. Yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> If you could figure out a way to reduce the dust and the hair in your resin, I would love to know it. Um, in all honesty, I've tried a lot of things. So spraying water, um, taking a spray bottle and like spritzing the air with water before you start using, you know, before you start mixing, it helps. That helps a little bit. Everything's kind of like baby steps, right? There's no one magic answer to this, but everything helps a little bit. I have a um, an air filter that's right by me while I'm working. I also... Don't shoot me on this one. I don't use a respirator. Um, so I have the air filter to me. It, all of the smell and the, the fumes and stuff go into the air filter. Uh, but does it help with dust and, and, you know, I don't have hair in my house, honestly. But I mean, I got hair all over the place with my three girls. But <laughs> I don't have any hair in this room or any, you know, cat and dander or anything like that floating in the air. But, um, but dust, yeah, there's always dust. There's no way to avoid that. And I don't know how much it helps with that so much. Um, I think the best advice I have is make sure that everything's clean before you start. Take your cup. This is a big one, right? Take your cup and rinse it out and dry it out with a dust-free cloth. That's a biggie because if there's anything in the cup, you're going to pour your resin in it and you're going to start to mix it up. It's going to be now in your resin, right? Um, so do that. Take a dust-free cloth, mo moisten it just a tiniest bit and go over your piece really really well with it before now be careful again like i said about the primary elements don't want to wet them so be careful of that but just if you're going to go over it with an ever so slightly damp cloth that's not going to reactivate anything but do that before you start the biggest thing is get a light source right upside where you're working and look down on an angle at your piece as you're doing it and to be able to pull them out with a tweezer and just get a really, really great tweezer. And that's kind of the way to go. I mean, it's really the only way to do it. And then last but not least, can you use alcohol spray to minimize bubbles instead of a torch? <laughs> so yes and no. Um, yes, you can. I will never do that. Now, story time. Um, <laughs> here's the Jivan is an idiot story time, okay? I decided as a genius move, and this is why I will never do it, um, you know, I clean up with alcohol along the way and I always have just a little bit of resin left in the cup. And so I decided to kind of play around because like I said, I haven't done like the coasters and the trays yet, but I'm, I'm, I want to build up to that and I want to get more experienced with what I'm playing with and, and that stuff. And so I thought at the end, okay, well, I have like a good ounce there. That would be a really cute, um, like coaster, right? So if I can get that and then I could pull it out of the container that would be cute so I want to color it so I took my pigments and I dissolved them in alcohol you can see where this is going right and I dissolved them in alcohol before I put them into the resin and mixed in beautifully it was so pretty and then I saw some bubbles and genius over here decided okay I'll just torch the bubbles away well I had just poured alcohol into the resin it wasn't the resin that was the problem it was the alcohol so I go with my torch and I just went real quick to try to kill the bubbles that were sitting on the top. And what happened? The dang thing went on fire. <laughs> Never again will I put alcohol anywhere near resin in any way, just because, you know, I don't think that far ahead of things. Sometimes I'm just in the zone and I'm not using my common sense. And it just went out right out the window. So please, please, whenever you're using torch, keep a fire extinguisher nearby. <laughs> In case you make a dumb dumb move like I just did. So anyway, moving right along. <laughs> I hope you had a good giggle at that one. So, okay, technique. How do you do what you do and why? So how do you control your hair dryer while blowing? So I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't hold my hair dryer the same way that a lot of other people do. Most other artists I've noticed keep their hair dryer upside down and they blow with the nozzle and I can't twist it sideways. Okay, and they blow this way and that way and they move it. That's very uncomfortable for my wrist. So what I do to keep, and the reason why I think they do it upside down is to keep the cord out of the way. So what I do is I take the cord, I wrap it around my arm and I hold my hair dryer sideways. So now my nozzle is in the same position, my dryer is out of the way and it's more comfortable for my wrist to then go like this, side to side like a snake. Um, I also then 
hold the hair dryer really high up, go down and out. What you don't want to do is hold your hair dryer any further than a 45 degree angle. Because if you're going to, at least when you're starting off until you know what you're doing more. Um, when you do that, you're going to then splatter your paint everywhere, all over your canvas and all over your walls. And you don't want to do that. Uh, how do you use a dryer to blow out your base paint and why? Okay, so same thing. Hold your hair dryer really up high until you start to see your paint start to move. Okay, then you move your dryer around, keeping it up and, you know, at perpendicular. All right, then, then you start to angle. Don't go any further than 45 degrees and just push the paint into the corners and to where you want it to go. Now, why do I use my dryer? So when I first started painting, um, I watched Rinska. Rinska is gonna use her dryer. I think, okay, well, that's the way to do it. And so I started doing it that way. Whenever I would use anything else, I didn't feel like I got the right amount of coverage on the canvas. Um, so I just made kind of my goal to become comfortable with using the dryer. I mean, you're using your dryer for everything else anyway with the Dutch pour, so why not blow out your base paint with it? So how do you stop the paint from spreading as it dries and why does it do that? Okay, so to that end, um, if you're going to use something other than your dryer or tilting to spread your base paint, you are probably ending up with a lot of paint on the canvas, too much paint on the canvas. And if you do that, then what happens is you're putting a lot of paint on your base. Then you're putting on a lot of paint on the top. Then you're leaving it alone. Well, paint is going to self-level and it's going to self-level off your canvas and onto your table, right? So you need less paint on your canvas, bottom line. Again, that's why I use the dryer. Just how much do you put on the canvas? If you're going to take whatever method you're going to use to spread it around, if you then take your canvas and you tilt it and you notice the paint's running like crazy, you have too much on there, okay? Um, if you also notice that it doesn't move at all, you have too little on there. So just keep that in mind. How do you prevent cracking? Okay, so there's a couple different reasons why cracking happens to begin with. Either your paint is too thick, you have too much paint on the canvas, there's some sort of airflow in the room like a fan or your heat or your air conditioning is on and it's blowing on your piece. Um, or you have a window open and it's blowing on your piece, uh, or it's too hot in the room. I don't know about too cold in the room. I've never had that be an issue, but too hot is definitely an issue. Um, and so how do we avoid that from happening? Well, the reasons why your paint is cracking is because the very, very, very top surface level of whatever amount of paint you have on there is drying first. That's drying, and then the wet paint underneath it needs air to dry and so it cracks and the air goes to get to this bottom paint the air is trying to get to the bottom paint and that's what ne it needs to crack in order to do that because this bottom paint needs air so it's making the top crack almost similarly to when if you've ever seen those videos of hot lava and it hits the water and how it you know it becomes a rock it cracks and then the lava comes straight through and that becomes a rock and cracks and then the lava comes straight through that and it comes along same thing your top layer is like a crust that's cracking in order to let the bottom layer get the air. Okay, so you wanna make sure that your paint is not too thick and there's no airflow in the room because then if your fan is blowing on it, even if it's a decent temperature, the fan is, is drying that top layer. Okay, um, how do you prep your canvases and how do you finish your canvases? Do you use hardware? So I showed you how to prep my canvas with the tape on the back and the screws, okay? How do I finish them? The only thing that I do that's special if for, um, if for finishing is if I have a colored base paint, if I have like one of the iridescents or you know a real dark paint or something, what I will do is I will paint this white layer um, here, this white border of canvas, I'll paint that while this is still on here. So I'll resin it, peel the tape off the resin, paint that area here, that solid color, because I think it just looks really nicely finished, and then take the whole thing off, and this is a nice clean wood. Uh, do I use hardware? No, I don't. So the reason why, again, I'm just gonna keep using this as an example. The reason why is that if you're gonna put those um, hooks on with the teeth, right? Well, and I'm being very exaggerating here, the top part of your canvas is gonna sit off the wall, and the bottom part is gonna hit the wall, and that sort of makes your canvas on a very slight angle, I don't know. I don't think it's necessary. Because I'm selling the level three, I'm using it with a real thick wood layer. I just tell people put two uh, nails in your wall 
at equal distance and this will sit on them perfectly. Just make sure they're level and don't make them too, you know, thick because you don't want them to go through the canvas. Um, but that's kind of, it's, that's supportive enough. You don't need anything else. You could put that wire again. Why bother? I've no, I've always found that the wire just, you have a hard time balancing it. If you put one nail in the wall, forget it. It's always tilted a little bit one way or the other. And if you're going to put two nails in the wall anyway, why bother with the wire? You're going to just, you know, hang the, the frame directly on them. So no, it's next. I lost my place. How do you know if a paint is opaque or transparent? Okay. All right. Let me grab that bottle. So every paint bottle is going to have or should have it somewhere on the actual bottle where it says opaque semi-transparent transparent light fastness one of those things on like this bottle for example on the very front it has this little square right and on the back it has the same thing the little square and then it says opaque next to it okay if the little square on your bottle is filled in that means it's opaque sometimes they'll have plus signs next to it um, and you can look up on each one of their websites what exactly their code means and how you can judge how light fast or how semi-transparent that is. What does it mean to be opaque? I got this uh, question recently. Opaque just means that the light can't pass through it at all. So if you've got an opaque base paint and you've got a semi-transparent top paint, your top paint could if you've got a very dark one, like somebody on one of the websites had on, on the Facebook page had a black base paint and a red top coat and the red top coat was semi-transparent. Well, then it sort of, as it's drying, it's disappearing and she's going, I don't understand what's going on with my paint. You need opaque on top of opaque. So now a lot of people will layer them differently because of that. Um, why it matters. Yes, it does matter in your, it will affect your final product for sure. So just keep that in mind. So how do you layer your colors? Okay, I <laughs> just said it. How do you layer your colors? So if you have colors that you know are semi-transparent or transparent and you have opaques, yes, you wanna layer them on top of each other differently than, it depends on the effect you want, honestly. You can have four opaque colors on top of each other and four transparents on top of each other. The transparents will blend differently and I think that's just personal preference and it depends on what look you're going for. And how do you pick your colors? Okay, so this is a big one. Um, and I wanna do a little pet peeve moment here for a second. So I have an art background, I'm very color sensitive. And so I honestly just kinda of do it by feel. <laughs> I do it by instinct. I decide, you know what, I wanna do something blue today. So I'll grab my blue and then I'll grab a different one. I'll grab four different colors and I'll look at them together and go, yeah, no, I don't wanna do that. And then I'll change it again and look at it. No, I'm not sure about that. And then if I'm really, you know, if I have a client who's really requesting specific colors I'm not sure about, I will do a test run, which is what I use the canvas panels for, or I'll use a six by six um, ceramic tile. I'll do a little tiny puddle pour on it and blend them and see how they mix. Sometimes I'll just blend them with a stick and see how they work together. If I don't like it, I'll make a change and make a suggestion or whatever. If I'm not sure, but I love the colors, I'll layer them differently and sort of play with them that way. Here's why I mentioned about the pet peeve. So I know a lot of you use Pinterest to get color schemes and there is nothing wrong with that. That's great. But keep this in mind. If you're looking at the, the way Pinterest works when it comes to color schemes is they'll show you a photograph or a painting, usually a photograph, and then the colors on the side as to this is what you see in this photograph of a beautiful flower. Right now, what they're not taking into consideration is a photograph is very different than paint pouring, okay? So colors that look gorgeous right up against each other in a photograph will blend horribly when you paint pour them. So just keep in mind when you're looking for color schemes, how they're gonna blend together, not just how they look in that pretty picture, okay? So just take that into consideration when you're thinking about how, you know, the color scheme to work with. Uh, but it, Pinterest is a great place to find color schemes, but just take that, keep that in mind. Okay, why do you flood or blow your paint over? So, okay, I learned from Renska, like I said, and you know, that's what she does, so that's what I started doing. A Couple months after I started doing that, um, a few artists stopped doing the flooding um, and the blowing over. And personal preference, I like it that way. I like the blending of colors and the softening of colors that happens when you blow over and you flood. Now, it's personal preference. They don't like that. I don't necessarily like it when it's not done. When the colors aren't blended at all first before you blow them out, 
Sometimes you get these real thick bars of color that are left behind that didn't blend together. And that's just not my look. It's just not my style. It's no offense to anybody out there, but that's just not the way I do it. So that's why I do my, my flooding and my blowing over. Uh, how do you price your work? Oh, what a loaded question. Okay, so I think every YouTube artist asks this question and everybody on you know Facebook asks this question um, on the Facebook groups. So there is a chart out there. I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, what we'll do, we'll say, calculate square footage on a 12 by 12 inch canvas and then calculate, you know, take that square footage and multiply it by this multiplier, 25 cents an inch, 35 cents an inch, 45, 55, 65 cents an inch. And this is how you judge. Now, meh, I don't really think that that works for what we do. I think that that's great for some other forms of art. I'm not a big fan of using that chart. I don't find, I find sometimes that's really underselling your work and sometimes it's really overselling your work. So I don't use that chart. Um, the way that I do it and the way that I recommend people do it is to calculate your supplies and calculate your time. If you're using a level one canvas that you got for a dollar, put that into your mind. If you're using student acrylics that you got for a dollar, keep that in your mind. If you're using, you know, a level three canvas that you spent $20 on and you're using Amsterdam paints or golden paints, I mean, you're spending a lot more on supplies. So that's going to be at, you know, in your costs. You have to calculate your costs and then try to add your profit to it. So that's going to be part of your costs. Then figure out what you think your time is worth and don't undersell yourself. I know the people are going, well, I don't know. I'm not sure if my painting is worth more than 10 bucks. I guess it is. <laughs> if you think it's good enough to sell, then value yourself enough to sell it for what you're worth. If you were going to do an office job, you would get paid per hour, right? Well, this is a job. If you're selling your work, you are working, right? And so you, you are worth giving yourself the right salary. So keep that in mind, okay? And then don't forget shipping. Always, always, always tell people, you know, plus shipping because somebody could live an hour away from you and shipping is five bucks. Somebody could live in, you know, another country and shipping is $45. So you don't want to ever say included in shipping because then your profit's right out the window. Okay, do you have to torch and torch distance from your canvas? Uh, yeah, you do. In a Dutch pour and with resin, honestly, you do. Um, now the torch distance from the canvas Again, if you're nervous about this, just start way up high. Make sure your torch is on high, okay? Because if, if it's on low, you gotta get real close to the canvas and hold it there longer, you may scorch your paint. So even though it sounds like it's counter, you know, counterintuitive to say it that way, it's true. Put it on high, keep it real up high away from the canvas. Start to lower it down to the canvas. As soon as you see the bubbles popping, move it. Move it real fast, okay? And just go around and around and around. Keep it off for a second, do it again if you find more bubbles, okay? You really can't use this on a Dutch pour. Um, it will overheat the top surface of your paint and you'll end up with that nasty skin and you don't want that. Um, you can use it for resin, but I find it doesn't pop the bubbles so easily in resin. It's more used to move the resin around or to blend colors together if you're using colored resin um, or if you're doing resin artwork. You know, it's better than just if you're trying to top coat a painting with resin and kill bubbles then the torch is better for me personally. I like that better, it's more comfortable. How long do you wait before pouring over a bad piece? So I don't keep a lot of my bad pieces, honestly. Um, I scrape them most of the time, but if I find that I liked something and then after a while I go, hmm, this wasn't a great piece. As long as there's nothing wrong with it, as far as the way it dried, if it dried too weird, if it cracked, if it did any of that, I just scrap it, just get rid of it. Um, because anything that you pour on top of a painting that's got like a cracked surface, you're gonna see that texture on the next piece. So why bother? Um, I have taken to soaking off the paint, off of the canvas. The problem is the gesso comes with it and it's just way too much effort for me <laughs> to do that. If you take the, the time it takes to then take the piece and soak it and scrape it and put the gesso back on it, wait for it to dry. I'm just, I don't have the time. So I don't bother with that anymore. Um, if it's fine, if there's nothing wrong with the piece, then I, again, I just wait for it to be bone dry and then add a week to that. Because if there's any moisture in that piece at all, again, the, whatever you put on top of it's not gonna dry properly. You can get all cracking and grazing and all that good stuff, so you don't want that. Okay, moving along to personal questions next. 
Okay, so you all wanted to know about this stuff and that's why we're talking about it. Uh, what's my background? Okay, so I am 46 years old. I have uh, been married to my husband now for a very long time. We've been together for 23 years. And I have three little girls. Nicolette, or Nikki, is 13. Briella is nine. And Liliana is seven. And yes, I do have an art background. So I started painting in high school 30 years ago. God, it feels like yesterday, but it wasn't. <laughs> it really wasn't. Um, so I started doing abstract work back in high school. I'm nothing like this at all. I mean, totally different. Um, but I started painting and fell in love with that. I used to break up mirrors and glue them. So I guess you could call them multimedia pieces I was doing. I don't know. Um, I was just having fun with it. And then I started painting the backgrounds for the school plays and doing that kind of stuff. Um, then when I got my first house, I faux finished the whole house because, you know, I wanted to do something different in every room. It was 2000. So, you know, I wanted to do something different in every room. And there was like the roller texture and like the Venetian plaster and all that sort of stuff. So I did that. I used to build furniture for fun. So when I was capable, um, you know, I've always done something creative. I wanted to go to art school. My dad said, yeah, that's not a career. And so I didn't do that. Well, then when I was 28, I decided I've done everything else on the planet as far as business is concerned, and I hate it all. I want to go back to art school. <laughs> so I went and became an interior designer. So that was my passion for a very long time, and I absolutely loved it until I had my first daughter. Uh, what or who inspired you to start painting and why the Dutch poor? Okay, so uh, carrying on with that story. Um, so... I decided a long time ago, when I first met my husband, we talked about it, and I always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. And he wanted a wife who was a stay-at-home mom. And that was our goal, and that was our intention, and we saved up our money to do that, and we were lucky enough to be able to do it. So, you know, I had my first daughter, I was 33. And for the next 13 years, I went through a lot of physical problems. Um, and we'll get to this at the end, but my physical disability that I did not know I had at the time, um, got worse with every pregnancy and I'd had three kids now. So I was on bed rest for five months with these kids. There was tons of surgeries in my thirties, nightmare time. Um, and I had these little kids to take care of. So my identity really became, you know, wife, mother, disabled woman. And that was it. I had no hobbies. <laughs> um, you know, I had mom friends, um, but I didn't have a life of my own, if you want to call it that. Right? It was all kind of around everybody else. I did as much housework as I was capable of doing. I took care of my kids the best I knew how, and I was a good wife to my husband. And that was that. So that was a very long time that I was doing that and, and recovering from surgeries. <laughs> and, you know, so when my final daughter, my last daughter, went to first grade, um, I was home alone until 4 p.m. every day. And I went, okay, I... I don't want to just, you know, lay down and rest until they get home, um, do the housework. And, you know, like, there's got to be more to than this, right? Like, my kids are all good. They're taken care of. They're out of the house now, and they're in school all day long. And I need something that's just for me. I need something that's not about the house and the laundry and the dishes and the everything else. And I think a lot of you can relate to this. I need something that's not about my husband. It's not about my kids. It's not about taking care of them. It's about taking care of me. I need something for me that's just mine, right? And so I started looking at, you know, what do I want to do? What am I, you know, what are my interests? And now, unfortunately, I couldn't go back to work because I'm not physically capable of doing that. And so that wasn't an option. And so I'm looking at hobbies and things like, you know, like frivolous things and what can I do that I can find fun? And randomly, I came across a post on a mom's board uh, on Facebook of a woman who made a painting and put it out there and said, hey guys, like, is this as good as I think it is? Because I really love it, but I'm not sure if it's as good as, you know, I think that I did. And it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And I'm like, wow, what did, how did she do that? And somebody else said, is that a Dutch pour? Well, what do I do? I go, what is a Dutch pour, Google? <laughs> Immediately. And who popped up? Rinske Downer, first and foremost, right? The queen of all Dutch pours. So I became obsessed and just started, you know, watching every single video of her twice. <laughs> and then I found Tammy Anderson and I watched every video of hers twice. And I just finally went to myself, what am I waiting for? I love this. This is great. I used to be really into painting and I could totally get into that again. And I think I could do this and, you know, go for it. Let's see what happens. And I just bought all the stuff and, you know, started at it. And then a couple of months later, I went, I think I feel confident enough to start a YouTube channel. That sounds like fun. You know, why not? Um, 
And that's how this happened. <laughs> that's how the crazy started. Uh, okay, where are you from? I can't place your accent. Oh boy. So, I'm um, originally from New York, uh, born and raised on Long Island. When I was about 35, we moved here to Southern California. And in about a month, I'll be moving to Nevada. So, yeah, <laughs> we're nomads, I guess. Um, so I think, you know, I have that New York in the back of back of my accent here, but then it's sort of covered up by trying to be neutral Southern California. I don't know. It's just, you hear a little bit of everything, I think. That's why you can't really place it as one specific area. But as soon as I say New York, people say, oh yeah, uh -huh, I hear it. <laughs> All right, what other styles do you paint or do you want to try? So I, do, I haven't done anything else on camera except for the Dutch boar, right? But I do also do different kinds of abstract painting with a brush uh, and a catalyst wedge, and I love that, and I will post some videos of that when I feel like it. <laughs> At some point, I'll get around to it. I've had a lot of commissions lately, thank you, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing that a lot more on camera than anything else. Uh, do you have an Etsy shop? Where do you sell your work if you don't, and how else can we support you? So, I don't have an Etsy shop. Um, I do just, if you're interested, just email me. Um, I post that on my videos, and I have my, all my work posted on Instagram for people to see there. So if you want to commission a piece, you go on Instagram and see the different styles that I have, pick one of those styles, and then we talk about colors and all that good stuff. We email back and forth. How can you support me? Well, first of all, thank you so much for that question. That's really, really nice. Um, I do have a PayPal link in my description for the people who are dead set on sending me um, a donation. I'm very uncomfortable with the donations. I gotta be honest with you. I'm just, I'm in an okay position in my life. I don't feel like I need to take money from people, you know, even though it's so sweet and so incredibly nice of people to do that. Um, I, I don't know. I'm just, I've never been a good at accepting things <laughs> that I haven't earned. Um, what I would say is how you can support me. Share the videos, like the videos, um, tell your friends about me and tell them to subscribe to my channel. You know, support me in that way would be amazing. Emotional support is awesome. Um, if you ever see someone as a hater, just knock them down. <laughs> I'm kidding. But um, yeah, I think that more supporting my channel um, is great. Oh, a really great way that I haven't really gone down that road yet um, is eventually I hope to get a um, an Amazon shop. Now, how do those work and how does that support me? It doesn't cost you anything, which is why I like it, okay? If an artist has an Amazon shop, which like I said, I don't have one yet, but I, I can get links and put like all like the hairdryer and stuff like that, uh, you know, in my description. Um, what happens then is that if you go into Amazon through one of those links, through someone's shop link or through a link that they put into their description, that then opens Amazon up. You shop for anything in the world. You can say, you know, I'm going into the link, you know, that's for this, for the, for the heat gun, but I don't want a heat gun today. I just want to use your link. You can go into Amazon through the link of anything. You can go buy toilet paper, paper towels and, you know, a t-shirt and not buy anything art related. And then if you exit Amazon and make a sale before you then go like to check your email or to check Facebook or whatever else. If you stay on Amazon, once you go through that link and you finish your finalize your sale, that whatever your um, final sale is, that artist that you use the link for gets a tiny bit of a commission for that. And it doesn't cost you a thing. So it's a great way to support someone's channel without actually sending them money through PayPal. Uh, okay, what do you, do you paint with your kids and do you have videos with them? So of course I paint with my kids. Um, absolutely paint with my kids. Do I have videos with them? No, I don't. And uh, the next following question was, do they have their own channels? No, they don't. I have three little girls. I'm really careful about putting them on camera. I just, it makes me uncomfortable. Um, they would love to be on camera with me. Maybe someday I'll do a video with them, you know, if anybody's interested in that. But um, finding, you know, more about my family, I don't know if that's a kind of a personal thing. But for them to have their own channels, I just feel like it's exposing them out there. I, I'm, again, I just, it's little girls. I'm very sensitive to that. And a little nervous of who watches those videos? You know what I mean? Do adult men watch those videos? I just, I don't know. It's that mama bear in me that just goes, nah, maybe not. They don't need to do that. You know, <laughs> They don't need money. <laughs> they don't need to, I think, value themselves on the likes and the stuff like that so much. So it's just something that makes me uncomfortable. I don't know. It's a personal thing. It gives me the little heebie-jeebies. Uh, do you have a Facebook group? No, I don't. Uh, I don't feel like I can add anything to a Facebook group that anybody else doesn't already have out there. So 
I don't feel like I have the time to do any kind of a Facebook group. And if I don't have anything unique to add, then I don't feel like it's the right thing to do. Okay, what is your disability and how does it affect your life? Okay, that's a biggie. So I talked about it once before briefly. Um, I have a genetic disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, hypermobility type three, or hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So there's 13 different types. It is a rare genetic disorder affecting one in 5,000 people to one in 25,000 people. It is very often misdiagnosed and not understood very well. Uh, and what it does is that my body creates faulty collagen. Now, who cares, right? Why does that matter? Well, collagen is not just for pretty skin, which is what we've all told collagen creams and collagen supplements will make you beautiful, right? Well, no, collagen is the building blocks for your entire body. And so when me creating faulty collagen from the inside out, unfortunately, I can't just take a supplement and have that change anything for me. It won't affect me in any way. But what it does is it affects two body systems the worst for me. Now, everybody's different. There are some people that have it that live as contortionists and that's a positive thing in their life because they've been making a living out of it. There are some people that are wheelchair bound and can't swallow anything and have an NG tube. So, you know, there's a wide range of how this affects people and how disabling it is. Um, so for me, it affects two body systems the worst, my spine and my muscles um, because of my connective tissue. Now. Again, the building blocks for everything, your connective tissue, the purpose of your connective tissue is to hold your body upright and strong and together. And mine is like loosey goosey and does not do that. It doesn't do its function. So because the connective tissue isn't working the way that it should, it's not doing its job, the other systems in my body have to make up for it. And so my muscles are overworking themselves to do the job of the connective tissue. So they're like this at all times. And I have constant muscle spasms. Walking down the street is like running a marathon for me. So that's one thing, pain. I'm in constant pain, even though I don't show it and I smile a lot. Um, I'm always in pain. And so I'm hypermobile means ultra flexible. Okay, so like this doesn't hurt me at all. Um, and yet my joints completely lock up. And so when you say like, how does that affect you? And why do your hands shake? My joints don't function properly. Either they're too loose or they stiffen up. And my spine is collapsing from the inside. So I look fine on the outside and I'm crumbling on the inside. Um, so far I've had 28 surgeries, nine of which have been spine surgeries, and I need another biggie, the worst one yet, which I'm trying to avoid at all costs. Um, one of the things that I have wrong with me is called spinal stenosis. And what that means is that your spinal cord is like a giant electrical cord, okay? And it's supposed to sit in a tube that is round. Well, my tube is like this. So it's choking my spinal cord, which causes all kinds of pain and numbness down my arms. And my leg is numb about 50% of the way up to my mid thigh. So that causes me all kinds of other problems for I'm overcompensating and all this other jazz. Um, how does it affect my painting? Um, basically, I have to take a very long break two or three days after a painting session and I'm hurting for you know more on the couch and more in bed and, and that stuff. But it's this has been such a big change in my life doing this and doing you know YouTube. And it's given me so much more than just being a wife and mom and disabled person. Um, it's made it something worth it. You know, I could do the laundry and be hurting and then be on the couch for two days, but instead I'm doing something that I love. And so what if I hurt afterwards? That's kind of the way I have to look at it, right? Um, okay, I'm not trying to get emotional. So, you know, for me, this has been so rewarding that it's worth the negative effects of the things that it does to me. Because this is the life I've been given. This is the only life I've been given. And this is the way it has to be. So I have to accept it and try to deal with it the best way that I know how, take my disability with grace and make the best out of, you know, my life that I can. And this is one of those things that's just brought me so much joy and so much, you know, so rewarding that it, it's worth it. Okay, off the personal stuff, back to the painting. <laughs> okay, that was too heavy. Um, <laughs> on to the stuff, this is opinions and advice. What do you think of the ready to pour paints? I don't, I, I don't, I've never used them. Um, I've seen a lot of reviews on them and people either love it or hate them. I think that they're not as much made for the Dutch pour 
as they are for um, other pouring methods because I think that they don't have the same chemical reactions with other paints um, that create the little, you know, my mini baby cells and um, kind of the, they flow differently. So I've just never used them because I just don't see the need for me personally. Uh, what do you use house paint? Why or why not? No, I don't use house paint. Um, again, I think that's more for the bloom. I have heard of people using house paint for Dutch pours. Me, I tried it once. I'm not a fan. I just feel like, again, it chemically speaking, it reacts differently to my artist paints. So I know it's acrylic paint, but it's not the same. <laughs> so I just don't use it. Uh, okay, here's a good one. Why does Floetrol dull my paints? Okay, so Floetrol is a chemical. It is not made to be a pouring medium, even though sometimes we use it as one. Okay, it was made to um, smooth out house paint to make it go through those sprayers easier. So if you notice, if you ever go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you're trying to find it, you can't find it in the paint section, go over to the tools section and ask them where the paint sprayers are that house painters use. And what they do is they pour it, you know, they mix it in with their paint to thin it out and they pour it in the paint sprayers in order to be able to spray it on the wall. And then it's nice and smooth and you don't get streaks. But chemically speaking, something in there along the way dulls out, you know, the shine off of uh, a gloss paint. So keep that in mind. You can take it back with, you know, if you want to add some pouring medium in there to bring your gloss back, you can do that. Anytime you're going to resin or you're going to varnish afterwards, you're going to bring your gloss back that way. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, can I use Floetrol as a medium with primary elements? Pigments. No, you can't. It doesn't have any binder in it. Again, it wasn't meant to be a pouring medium. Okay, it's meant to be a paint conditioner. So what happens then is it's the same thing as adding water. Now, it'll wet them. You can put it on the painting that way. But when the water uh, evaporates, you're going to be left over with dry pigments that are just going to flake off your canvas. Floetrol is the same thing. There's no binder in it. There's nothing, there's no glue to it holding it together. So then when you pour on your pigments with it onto the canvas, it looks great. It's good. It dries and it flakes right off. Um, or it just won't adhere and then you go to seal it and it like clumps up and weird things happen and you're not sure why. It definitely will smear and spread. Even with a resin, sometimes that will happen. So just, yeah, don't do that. Uh, do you use silicone? No, I don't. I don't bother with silicone. I did when I first started. I thought, okay, cool. That's a great way to make silicone, you know, to make those cell effects. And then I realized afterwards when I went to seal it that you have to clean silicone off of your canvas. And I went, forget this stuff. I don't need this. I can do cells without it. I don't need it. Uh, which brand of white do you use? Mine is chalky. So I use any brand of titanium white. Um, I find that they're pretty much all the same. I don't think it's brand that matters as much as it matters that it's titanium white and not just white paint. Uh, I know a lot of artists use that uh, Artist Loft Flow Acrylic White. That's a very different um, like composition than a titanium white um, and it has a different consistency. So I don't use that because I find that when then I mix it, it's a different mix and it's all. So yeah, I don't bother with that. Any kind of titanium white I like the effects of. It doesn't end up chalky. Mm, what do I do if I forgot to pre-paint my sides? So you can do a couple of different things. Um, if you like the look of a solid side, you can take whatever color the base coat is or one of the colors in the piece. I like a base coat because then you don't have to worry about making that line on top exact. So let's say you have a painting like this one with a white background and color and you're gonna try to then edge your trim with you know, um, from your ends, I should say, with this teal color, well, you gotta be really careful about putting it up against this edge that you don't then, you know, make it wavy and line. And so what I would do there, anytime you're gonna use tape and you're mixing two colors together, okay? I would take the tape, put it over the area, put a sealer coat, if you wanna call it that, of a clear paint, and then put your colored paint. Because then it won't seep underneath. Anything that seeps underneath the tape is gonna be the clear coat. That then seals your tape to the canvas, and then whatever color you're putting on top is sitting on top of the clear coat. You peel your tape off, and you've got a nice clean line, okay? Um, I also would say that you know using the base coat as the base color as the edge coat, if you like that point, or you can take a very small brush, a thin brush, and go in between the drips with the base coat color, and that looks really pretty. That's what I usually do because I like the drips to go that go over the side. 
And what is your opinion on the paint pouring canvases? You said that the one you bought were warped. Okay, so yeah, not a fan of the paint pouring canvases. Sounded like a great idea up front. They have a hard board in between the canvas and the frame. Um, and so I guess it can hold the weight of, you know, a lot of paint without sagging, which sounded like a great idea. But the problem is that for me, the canvases are much thinner and not as the quality is not as good uh, of the canvas itself. So the problem then was when it was warped now, well, it's warped on top of the hardboard. I can't just spray the back and make the canvas tighten up that way. So either I have to spray the front and hope that nothing happens to the gesso and that that's not affected in any way. Um, or I have to like pull the whole thing apart and retension it and it's just not worth it. Uh, okay, on to paint mixes. And here is the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> what is my recipe and how many different recipes do I have? So in my bottles of paint, I generally have one recipe. Now, why have I never talked about it? Why do I not say, well, you know, I'm using this and this and this. So I have a mix of a lot of different ways of doing things and i don't have one i'm really not good at like being super precise on stuff and i'm more of like you know how people say like i'm a cook versus a baker and there's a very big difference between the two a cook just kind of goes by instinct and a baker is like so precise on every little teaspoon of something or other i'm a cook not a baker <laughs> i go by eye i go by yeah you know I'll throw a splash of this in there and see what happens um i'm very kind of loosey-goosey when it comes to my paint mixes so i don't always know what's in my bottles you know i'm not always 100 percent sure on that and i don't want to say to you guys hey this is what I'm using across the board because there is no across the board. There's a different one all the time. And I don't want to say this is what I used for this pouring, you know, for this, for this piece if I'm not 100% sure on it because I don't want to mislead anybody. Generally speaking, though, the paints in my bottles are one specific recipe. And here we go. Got a pencil? Okay. I'm going to talk in parts because part could mean anything. Parts can be ounces. Parts can be grams. Parts can be milliliters. Parts can be this cup you know, that I don't know the size of, but I know how big this cup is. It could be anything, okay? As long as you're being consistent and you're not saying, okay, I'm gonna use a gram of this and a milliliter of that. And I mean, that'll make you crazy. What you wanna do is make it consistent across the board. If somebody's giving you a recipe of things that are not the same uh, measuring in a, uh, level, what you wanna do is go onto Google and just do a translator from grams to milliliters or milliliters to ounces or whatever. Make sure everything's the same and then you can figure it out from there. As far as if somebody's got a recipe and you wanna follow the recipe, but they have four different you know, mixing methods, do that, just Google. <laughs> um, okay, so what do I use? I generally use two parts of Floetrol, one part of paint, three quarters to one part of water and a splash of pouring medium. Now, what does that mean, right? So for four ounces of a four ounce bottle, generally speaking, I use two ounces of Floetrol, one ounce of paint, three quarters to one ounce of water, and a splash. I don't know how much a splash is, probably a teaspoon-ish. Now, I just said not to do that, right? But that's just, I mean, I literally splash. I don't measure, so I'm just trying to gauge how much that is, and I don't know what a teaspoon is in ounces. So, <laughs> Sorry, I just told you not to do something and I did it, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so what? how does the water work out? Why is it three quarters to one part of water? Water will change depending on your paint. Every single paint has a different amount of water you want to use depending on how thick or how thin that paint is. You are not going to use the same amount of water in, for an Amsterdam paint or for a golden paint, or for the Artist Law Flow acrylic, like I was talking about. You're not gonna do that, or you're gonna get a different consistency as an outcome. And you wanna have all your consistencies be pretty close together. So if you hear someone say, this is my recipe across the board, generally speaking, they're only using one kind of paint. So they're only gonna be using Liquitex, or they're only gonna be using Liquitex in, in Amsterdam, or they're only gonna be using one of the other, because these things are different. There's also a difference in whether or not it's a metallic because the metallic is more dense of a paint than other paints are, okay? So what you wanna do, and this is what I generally do, is I mix my paints in a mixing cup and then I pour them in my bottles. I don't pour them in my bottle, shake them up and walk away. That, then you don't know, you can't judge from a, 
from a bottle how what your consistency is. And once you know your consistency and what you like and what works for you, you can see it. You know, you can tell by mixing it, but you can't see it in a bottle once it's mixed up. So what I do is I do it in a, in a cup first and then pour it into your bottle. Um, for primary elements, that depends on whether I'm using polypore or vivid enamel, um, but I generally using polypore or vivid enamel and water. Um, I don't really feel the need to use anything other than that. I do not use Floetrol with them. I will not use Floetrol with them. And whenever I mix them with a colored paint, what I do is I mix them with the polypore or the vivid enamel, and depending on what I'm using it for, and then I take the bottle of paint straight from the bottle, not mixed with my bottled paint already. Am I saying that the right way? Not the bottles that have my paint mix of Floetrol and water in them already, but I take them straight from the bottle and I'll take a squirt of this and I'll squirt it into the container that's already mixed of the polypore or the vivid enamel. Then I blend that up and I add a little extra water to it because then I'm not in, into, um, introducing the Floetrol into the mix when it doesn't need to be there. Uh, okay, what is the cheapest pouring medium? Water. Water's the way to go. Rinsky uses it. <laughs> She's a classic. Um, you know, she ends up with beautiful work. Water's very different though. So just be aware, whatever you start off with, that if you flip over one way or the other, if you start with float on water and then you go to just water, the paint behaves differently, okay? So just be aware of that um, when you're kind of, just know that ahead of time, that when you're mixing and when you're stirring and when you're trying to gauge um, consistency, it's very, very different. It will not flow off of the stick the same way. Um, it's a little more drippy but that means it's the right consistency. So it's very hard to kind of tell someone, you know, when you're using it, it's the easiest way to make sure that you're using the same consistency is to do a little sample squeeze. So what you wanna do is take your bottles um, or take, you know, your cup with it mixed or whatever, put a nice drop, put a good size drop onto a piece of paper. I use a, um, a tile. Um, you can use the, the hard boards, you know, the canvas boards, whatever it is. Take a drop of each one and put them side by side and then tilt. And you'll see the way that they run down. And if they're the same, uh, if they're running at the same rate, you got the same consistency. If one's going really slow, one's going really fast, this one's much thinner, this one's much thicker. So adjust, you know, as you want. But you can see then, depending on, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're used to one way with the flow trial and water and then you're flipping to water, but you're not sure about the, the consistency, do the running test and you'll see, okay, well, my other ones run real slow. These are running super fast or vice versa. Uh, when do I use polypore versus enamel? Okay, go to video number 20. <laughs> I got it all there. Everything's talked about there with the polypore and the enamel. Uh, where can I buy vivid enamel or vivid, vivid polypore? Uh, only on the Color Out website um, or Amazon. Now, Amazon's super convenient. Amazon is great. I love Amazon, don't get me wrong, but you're not gonna get my 20% discount or anyone's 20% discount, but mine, because it's my channel. Um, you're not gonna get the discount by going on Amazon, so just buy from the Color Art website directly. Uh, what's the cheapest way to start out paint pouring? So, here's the thing. Um, I don't believe in telling people to start with craft paints or inexpensive paints, and this is why. I'm not being a snob, I'm not saying, you know, I would say start with the less expensive canvases, for sure. Even canvas boards, whatever you like. Um, do the tiles, start with those, you can scrape those off and use those 40 different times. They'll never, you know, just wipe and wash them back off again and, and here you go again. Um, start pouring that way. If you wanna just practice, practice, practice before you jump to the good canvases, that's the way to do that. Here's why I'm telling you not to use um, artist, uh, only to use artist paints and not to use craft paints or student paints. Paint behaves differently, as I just said, okay? So if you're gonna get used to working with student grade acrylics or you know the craft paints and stuff like that, they're very, very thin, your paint mix will be different, your recipe will be different, and the way that the paint flows and mixes with other paint is different. So then you say, okay, I know what I'm doing now. I feel really good about this. I'm gonna go buy the more expensive paints. Now you have to relearn everything because it's completely different than using the craft paints. So here's my advice. Start off with less expensive um, things to pour on top of, okay, and better paints, but only buy a few better paints. Buy the basics, buy your favorite colors and buy the primary colors. Buy the bigger bottles of the primary colors that you can mix together to make any color. Buy a good white, buy a good black, and you're good to go. And that's it. And then you don't have to buy 50 paints 
you can buy just a few, but you can buy the good ones that you really get used to working with properly. And then, you know, when you go forward and you want to expand, then you're still working with the better stuff. Okay, next. All about YouTube. Okay, you guys want to start YouTube channels. Go for it. I fully support you. Let's start off saying that. Uh, why do you edit your videos and how? So I use a very simple editing app on my phone. Um, and I, look, I've tried. I've tried the really good movie level stuff. I tried the right cameras. I've tried the great... It was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. For me, easier is better. Thankfully, this is not something I'm trying to create a movie with. And so... Um, just recording on my phone and editing on my phone is the easiest way to do that. Why do I edit my videos though? Because I mess up <laughs> and because my, my, my paint pouring, see I'm stumbling my words already. My paint pouring doesn't last two seconds. I mean, I take a long time stopping and looking and looking at it this way and that way and seeing, do I like this? Do I like that? Do I want to blow it this way? Do I want to blow it that way? And I mean, you know, to create a piece takes forever and that would be the most boring video on the planet. So yeah, I edit out the boring stuff. Um, I try to make it easier for you guys to watch that way. And I flub my words, so I have to edit out things that I say. I mean, that's just honesty. Uh, is there a video of the big piece behind you? No, there's not. This gorgeous piece that I love so much. It is available for sale though. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love it, love it, love it. It's three feet by three feet. It's the biggest piece that I've ever made, but it was made before I started my channel. So I don't have a video of it, unfortunately. What's funny was after I did um, make it, I you know, I really should have recorded that because I was thinking of starting a channel and I just hadn't decided whether I was going to do it or not yet. And I kind of kicked myself for not recording it, you know, and thinking, well, I could do something with it later, but it is what it is. I am planning on for my 5,000 subscribers because um, I'm going to get there. I have faith. Um, I'm planning on doing a really big piece there too. I'm either going to do a three feet by three feet or a four foot by four foot. So let me know what you guys think on that one, but I'm going to attack the big guy. Yeah, for sure. That's the way to go. Uh, how did you get brave enough to start a YouTube channel? Okay. So here's the thing. Um, and this also, also followed up by the last question, best advice for a new YouTuber. I'm going to combine the two. Okay. Best advice for a new YouTuber, research, research, research. Um, go on to YouTube and research about YouTubers. Um, there's a ton of people out there that are really great at talking about the business of YouTube, how to start your channel, um, how to incorporate yourself, uh, how to grow your channel and, and how to promote yourself and all that good stuff. So research the living heck out of it. Um, just realize that it's going to take a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of time. So make sure that you have the time for this because you don't want it to be frustrating. You want it to be fun, right? So make sure you have the time in your life for it. Make sure that you have the patience and you're not expecting it to grow overnight and make sure you're willing to put in the effort because it does take a lot of effort as far as recording, editing, posting all your stuff. Um, answering comments, you know, all of that and, and scheduling things. Um, my best advice for a new YouTuber is really just to go for it. I don't know. I think that bravery is a big thing. Fearless. <laughs> I wore this shirt for a reason. Be fearless. You know what? What's the worst that can happen? This is the way I look at everything in life, right? What's the worst that can happen? It doesn't cost anything to start a YouTube channel. It costs your time and effort and energy. Okay. So if the worst thing that happens is in six months, you've got five subscribers. Oh, well, you scrap it and say that sucked and <laughs> move on. Right. I mean, it's not hurting you in your personal life in any way. Um, don't put any of your personal information out there as much as, you know, your, I don't know. I don't know your address. <laughs> don't put your address out there anywhere, I would say. Um, but again, the, for your address, what's going to happen? Are you going to have people knocking down your door and going, I hated that video? No, it's not going to happen. So, I mean, I just kind of take it with a grain of salt if it doesn't work out the way that you want it to and hope for the best because if it does work out the way you want it to, it can be a really great experience. Um, and I want to wrap it up with that. Uh, I want to thank everybody for this experience. Um, YouTube has been an incredibly validating, incredibly wonderful experience for me overall. Um, I've had two haters out there and you know what? You're going to have some haters. It is what it is. Who cares? You got to roll it off your back. Um, 
One woman actually said she couldn't stand my voice. <laughs> Why are you here then? <laughs> Why are you watching me if you don't like my voice? I don't know. It's those things that you go, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> change my voice? I mean, I'm not going to change anything about me because you don't like me. So they're just moving on along, lady. Um, you know, you can't take those people seriously. You just, but on the flip side of that, the people that are loving and sweet and kind and wonderful, there's so many more of those than the idiots out there that you just have to kind of like, Focus on that. Focus on the good. And to me, this has been a wonderful experience. I hope it will be for you. Let me know when you start your channel um, and I will totally support you. And I want to thank everybody for all of your unbelievable support for me over the last six, seven months. It's been wonderful. It's been validating. It's been just really ego boosting. Um, and and I, it really has changed my life for the better. So I want to thank you all for that. Thank you for being here tonight, for sticking with me this long. This has been a very long video, I know, but I hope that you found it useful and I hope that you found it valuable. And that is it for me for tonight. Thank you all, everybody, for being here. Have a great night, guys.